Woo! All right. Well, we are nine weeks into our summer sermon series that we've been calling Conquests and Compromises uh, in, the, in the book of Judges. And if you've been with us this whole time, uh, we have introduced you to this cycle that you see over and over again in this narrative. Um, I called it the, verse, uh, the, the first uh, message that I, I spoke, I called it the sin cycle, right? And as we've been through it, all right, so uh, we are at seven, chapter 17 and chapter 18 right now, so we're, we're almost done. But as we've been through it, we've seen this cycle over and over again. We've seen uh, the, the children of Israel, we've seen them enter into disbelief, which then uh, moved into disobedience, which then caused judgment and enslavement, and then they repented, and after they repented, God rose up a judge, a deliverer, and then that deliverer died, and then they went right back into the cycle. All right, so we've seen that over and over again as we've been reading this, this text together. But last week, we talked about, and Ken did an amazing job on the life of Samson, all right? And Samson is the last judge of the book of Judges. All right, but if you've been reading along with us, you know there's still five chapters left. All right, and so as we look at the rest of the book of Judges, chapter uh, 17 through 21, it is an absolute dumpster fire. Like, it's bad, and I'll just tell you ahead of time, there is no judge coming to deliver these folks. All right, um, and, and one thing that you learn as you study this is that this is actually not chronological. So the things that we talk about today it's not happening after the life of Samson. Um, it is actually um, an appendix. So the last five chapters of, of the book of Judges is, is actually more of a, an appendix, just to give us more of a, an understanding of what was happening at this point in Israel's history. And so what I love about this uh, is that, you know, to this point, we've gotten this helicopter view um, of, of Israel in this era, and we've been able to see the way in which the leaders have operated um, throughout this time. But as we proceed, we are going to get, we're, we're actually going to land and we're going to get on the ground floor. All right. And so what we're going to see as we finish this book is we are going to, to look into the, uh, the daily, the everyday Israelite life to get samples of the spiritual condition of all of Israel. We are going to glint, get a glimpse of what was happening in the home, what was happening in the ministry, and what was happening in communities. And so I, I said this uh, a few weeks ago, and I want to re reiterate this idea. Um, this, as we get into this part of, of the Bible, uh, uh, and Judges in general, but the end of Judges in particular, uh, these texts that we're going to be preaching the next couple weeks um, are among some of the, the passages of the Bible that are the least studied and the least preached. And it's because it is so dark, all right? And so I, I just celebrated my uh, 21st birthday in the Lord. So in the Lord, 20, 21st birthday this past week. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm 21 years old in the spirit. It's great. Um, actually, and one of my daughters, she said, you know what that means, Dad, right? And I was like, what? She's like, that means when you take communion, you can drink real wine. Okay, so <laughs> kids, kids. Uh, but I say that to say this. So in all the 21 years that I've been walking with Jesus, I've been studying scripture, reading the Bible, preaching, I have never heard anyone expound or preach on the text I'm going to share with you guys today. So good luck. All right. Good luck. All right. Let's see how I do. All right. So what we're going to look at today is what I would call signs of a declining faith community. Um, and I think what we need to do as we enter into these stories, because it's going to just get wild, okay, put your seatbelts on. But what we need to do is we need to be careful because it's really easy as we look at the lives of other people, especially in the culture we live in today, the social media culture we live in today, it's easy to critique other people's lives without paying attention to our own. And so what I want us to do is as we're going through this, and I was intentional about this as I was studying, as I was preparing to share with you guys, I was asking God, okay, God, as I read this text, may I not see this as I see my TV screen or my tablet screen, but Lord, let me observe this as a mirror. All right, what is it in here that you have for me? All right, what of myself do I see in here? And so signs of a declining faith community. How will we know if we are drifting away from God as a church, 
and as a people. We're going to look at that together. All right. And so I'm actually, I'm going to try to cover 17 and 18. So let's see if I can speed through this. All right. So starting in verse one of chapter 17, it says, there was a man named Micah who lived in the hill country of Ephraim. One day he said to his mother, I heard you place a curse on the person who stole 1,100 pieces of silver from you. Well, I have the money. I was the one who took it. The Lord bless you for admitting it, his mother replied. All right. And so the first sign of a declining faith community is a blurred concept of the true God. The first sign is a blurred concept of the true God. All right, so the story begins when a man named Micah goes to his mother and he says, hey, I've heard you pronouncing a curse on the person who stole 1,100 pieces of silver from you. I just want you to know I'm the one who did it. I stole it from you. Now, 1,100 pieces of silver in this time in Israel, so that's a lot of money. All right, you know how much money this is? 1,100 pieces of silver is the same amount of money that the Philistine leaders offered Delilah to betray Samson. Okay, this wasn't a bag of quarters, wasn't a few hundred dollars, all right? This was a life savings that he stole from his mom. And so he stole this, this from his, his mother and then he gave it back. Now, why did he give it back? Because maybe you hear this and you're like, oh, well, he's a bad guy, but he's not that bad because he gave it back, right? But why? Why did he give the money back? I would suggest to you, he gave the money back because he didn't want to be cursed, he didn't want to be cursed. He was concerned about one person in this scene. And that person wasn't God. That person wasn't his mother. That person was Micah. It was himself. Micah had sorrow, but he was self-centered in his sorrow. And so it was not sorrow that was based on grief of what he did to the heart of God. It was not sorrow based on grief because he stole a large sum of money, and it was not sorrow based on the fact that he stole this money from his mother. His sorrow was about his conscience, and it was stirred because there might be personal jeopardy because of his actions, and he wanted to escape the consequences of his sin. He didn't want to be cursed. See, this is reminiscent of Cain in Genesis 4 after he kills his brother Abel. You know the story, right? Cain kills Abel. And when God comes to him and pronounces a curse on him, what does Cain do? Does he repent? Does he say, man, God, I was having a bad day. My brother was annoying me. But no, you know what he says? He said, this punishment is more than I can bear. Self-centered in his sorrow. Paul talks about this in his letter to the Corinthians. Uh, he says this uh, in 2 Corinthians 7. He says, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet I am now happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to, what's that word? Repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. And here's the key verse. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See, the way that you can tell the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. And Christians, please hear me when I say this because we're really bad at knowing the difference here, okay? The difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow is godly sorrow has God as a main uh, uh, focus for the reasons of our distress. As God as the main reason and focus for our distress, worldly sorrow has the absence of God in the equation. Godly sorrow leads to repentance that leads to life. And so let me say it this way, because I really want us to get this. I really want us to get this. Sorrow over something you have done is not necessarily evidence of godliness. I'm going to say it again for the people in the back. <laughs> sorrow for something you have done is not necessarily evidence of godliness. There are people who don't love God, don't know God, don't care about God, who feel sorrow. All right? And so Micah shows us that confession can be an expression of self-absorption. I know a lot of people have been up here preaching so far, but y'all got to give me more feedback than this. <laughs> confession can be an expression of self-absorption. You can actually confess for your own benefit with no repentant heart change. This is what Micah's doing here. So he confesses in his... 
uh, to his mom. And I imagine his mom being like all other moms, right? Moms know everything, don't they? I'm, I'm finally adult enough to know that there are so many things that I thought I got away with as a child that my mom knew, but she just never said anything, you know? And so I feel like that's his mom as well, because she was going around the house saying, cursed be the person who stole my money. Cursed be the person who stole my money. And Micah's just sitting there, and finally he confesses, right? Finally he confesses. But right when he confesses, what does she do? She says, the Lord bless you, my son. Blessed be you of Yahweh, my son, is what she says to him. She goes from curse to blessing in an instant. And so right when we begin to wonder, okay, what is going on with this woman? What happens next removes all doubt if you're wondering if there's something wrong. Verse three, he returned the money to her and she said, I now dedicate these silver coins to the Lord. Okay, good so far. In honor of my son, I will have an image card and an idol cast. Eh. <laughs> so when he returned the money to her, she took 200 silver coins and gave them to a silversmith. Whoa, wait, wait, how many coins did he steal? 1,100? How many did she give away? Okay, just making sure. She gave it to a silversmith who made them into an image and an idol, and these were placed in Micah's house. Micah set up a shrine for the idol, and he made a sacred ephod and some household idols. Then he installed one of his sons as his personal priest. Okay, here's where the blur comes in. Your son returns the money to you that he stole from you. Life savings worth of money. And then you bless him without any real heart of repentance. You dedicate that money to the Lord, but then you give less than a fifth of it to actually be consecrated to the Lord. And when you consecrate it, the way you do this is you give it to a silversmith to make an idol. Come on, homegirl. <laughs> See, God has already established protocols for worship. The, ta the tabernacle was in Shiloh, and there were designated cities apart, uh, that were set apart for worship that were run by the Levites as priests and ministers. And so creating idols and setting up shrines was completely out of pocket. Okay? It was not uh, advisable in any way. It was uh, against the law of God that just by doing that, you're breaking the first two of Moses' uh, ten commandments. Commandment number one, I'm God, you don't get another one. Commandment number two, don't even make nothing that look like me broke both of them. And so we see with Micah's mom, we see with Micah and we see with his son that the power of idolatry in our lives can pass down to our children. Micah's mom made an idol. Micah then worshiped that idol and installed his son as a priest, which is to say this, that our idols are not private. They're not private. And so if your idol is comfort, you will set up shrines in your life and you will install your children as priests to minister to that God. If your idol is money and affluence, you will create environments in your life where you're communicating to your children in no uncertain terms that this is what my life is about. And you can evoke the name of Jesus all you want. This is what Micah's mom did. Blessed are, are you are to Yahweh. You can evoke the name of Jesus, but your children will know exactly what's going on. And so already this story is really embarrassing. The story is so bad so far, five verses in, that the narrator came and help himself. The narrator jumps in right away and says, I, I need to make sure people know what's going on. And he utters the famous line that, that you hear out of Judges. He says, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. All right. Verse 7. One day, let's move on. Whew. One day, a young Levite who had been living in Bethlehem in Judah arrived in that area. He had left Bethlehem in search of another place to live, and as he traveled, he came to the hill country of Ephraim. He happened to stop at Micah's house as he was traveling through. Where are you from? Micah asked him. He replied, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm looking for a place to live. Stay here with me, Micah said, and you can be a father and a priest to me. 
I will give you 10 pieces of silver a year, plus a change of clothes and your food. The Levite agreed to this, and the young man became like one of Micah's sons. So Micah installed the Levite as his personal priest, and he lived in Micah's house. And so the second sign of a declining faith community is spiritual compromise in spiritual leadership. Spiritual compromise in spiritual leadership. See, Micah has everything he needs for a homemade uh, religion starter pack. He has the idol, he has the shrine. He installs his son, right, as a, as a priest. He puts his, throws his son into ministry. And then a Levite knocks on his door, right? This Levite had a designated area to serve in Judah, but he leaves and decides to become a traveling minister. Now, Levites were either supposed to be serving at the tabernacle or they had a designated spot, a city that they're supposed to be in. But this Levite is wandering. And so if you're wondering why he's wandering, okay, one a commentator says that, you know, maybe many in Israel are like Micah and they're creating shrines in their own house. There's nothing to do at the tabernacle. But I, I believe as we look at more of his story, we're going to see that he's, he's spiritually wandering. Micah says, stay here with me. Be a father and a priest to me. I'll pay your salary. I'll take care of all your needs. And the Levite agrees. He agrees to do this. And he becomes like one of Micah's sons. Now, what does this mean? This means at least, this means at least that the Levite is comfortable in an atmosphere of idolatry. How about you? He was comfortable in an atmosphere of idolatry. This man was supposed to speak for God and serve God and represent God to the people and speak to the people on behalf of God. Yet he was willing to be hired out as a personal priest serving a false God. And what should he have done? What should he have done? I would suggest that if he was a righteous, God-fearing Levite, he would have gotten to that door, he would have saw what was inside, and he would have rebuked Micah right away. He would have said, this is why I don't have a job. <laughs> right? He would have rebuked Micah. He's like, there's no way I'm going, I would rather starve to death. But that's not what he does. He compromises. Now contrast that with another priest in Scripture. There's another priest. His name is Ezra. And Ezra, in Ezra chapter 9, shows up in Jerusalem after Israel has been exiled because of disobedience and idolatry, interestingly enough. And when he gets there, he gets reports that the people, uh, including the ministers and the priests and the Levites, are intermarrying and falling back into idolatry that got them expelled the first time. But he, he didn't think to himself, oh, I'm going to join in. You know what he did? He repented. And he, and he went around, he went to service that night and he made a spectacle of himself falling down before the Lord, wanting everyone to know just how wicked their actions were. And in Micah chapter 10, verse one is a beautiful verse. It says this, it says, while Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. One man repents on behalf of the nation and doing so sparked a revival. The people wept for their sins. Why? Because they had a leader that wept first. I wonder what would have happened in this story if the Levite would have been like Ezra. But instead, this is how Judges 17 ends. Micah says this at the very end of chapter 17, verse 13. He says, I know the Lord will bless me now because I have a Levite serving as my priest. I know the Lord will bless me now. See, this Levite, we're gonna later find out that he is a direct descendant of Moses and his name is Jonathan. Do you know what the, the name Jonathan means in Hebrew? Uh, Jonathan in Hebrew means Yahweh has given. It, it literally means gift from God. And this is what I wanna to say to you, that when you are walking in deception, all right, so remember, Levite comes to his door. Levite's name is Jonathan, knocks on the door. Oh, perfect, it's the Levite. He can serve me now. But when you're walking in deception, even gifts from God can be a stumbling block to you. Your career, your gifting, your affluence and possessions, your powerful positions, these things should be a blessing to you, but if you become unhealthy, and if those things become object of worship to you, gifts from God become curses. 
That's what they are. And so let me give you the third sign of a declining faith community. The third sign is building kingdoms without the proper king. Building kingdoms without the proper king. All right, we're getting into Judges 18 now. So starting in verse one, it says, now in those days, Israel had no king and the tribe of Dan was trying to find a place where they could settle for they had not yet moved into the land assigned to them when the land was divided among the tribes of Israel. And so the story now moves out of Micah's living room and you move down south to Zorah and Eshtel and you land amongst the tribe of Dan and they're living there and the narrator reiterates the condition of God's people. It says, there was no king in Israel and doesn't finish it almost as if to say to us, and you're about to see some people doing right in their own eyes. All right, now I wanna take a second just on that statement. We've heard that statement many, many times throughout this summer. And there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And as I was studying, I feel like God just exploded this statement in my heart. And the reason why is because uh, we hear this statement, and there was no king in Israel. But let me say this to you. This was not a statement about Israel's status as a nation. It was actually more of a statement about their relationship to God. See, um, God was supposed to be Israel's king but they were not honoring him as such. And so the major distinction that Israel possessed among other nations is that other nations had flawed men who were served and revered like gods to lead them. But you know what Israel had? Israel was led by prophets. You know that? They're led by prophets. Noah was a prophet. Abraham was a prophet. Moses was a prophet. Joshua was a prophet. They were led by men who would listen to the voice of God and they would speak to people on behalf of Yahweh, this invisible but all-powerful God who was supposed to be Lord and King. And so for them, this is where it started. They were not treating God as God. And because of that, you move to the second part of the statement. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. See, this can be a statement here about the rampant evil that was going on, but it also says something about a people who are shrugging off the law of God and the voice of God to do right according to their own wisdom and intellect. And this is the important part about this, is that these stories are telling us that doing right in your own eyes can still be the status of a society or community even while a form of religion and spirituality is present. It does not have to be a, a godless environment for you to be doing right in your own eyes. There can be religion and spirituality, perceived spirituality present in an environment where people are doing right in their own eyes. And so uh, I realize now, again, just the last couple of weeks as I've been preparing to speak, I realize why God led us to the book of Judges. We got into the summer uh, and we felt really strongly, this is the book we have to, to, to get into. And we, we, there's some things you understand about Judges that would be helpful. Um, but it's really hit me square between the eyes as I've been preparing for this. And it's because we, we are in a moment as a church and as an elder team where we are thinking and praying through our vision and our mission and our values. That's where we are right now. Uh, and the book of Judges shows us that when we are committed to living life by what is right in our own eyes, our decisions may look externally spiritual and correct, but they will lack God's guiding wisdom. Everyone in this story is doing what is right in their own eyes, and they believe that to be a positive statement about their condition. And so when we build our lives using our own wisdom and energy, we are inevitably prone to doing so using power plays and cultural idols. And so our commitment, and I speak on behalf of the elder team, and man, am I excited to see Josephine and Michael um, placed in next week. So that's going to be next week. But on behalf of the whole elder team, I just want to tell you guys that we are committed to becoming a discerning community. Amen. That we take this very seriously. We will not move unless we hear God. We won't. All right. And so we see the tribe of Dan looking for a place to settle. And it says that it's because they had not yet moved into the land assigned to them when the land was divided. Now, if you guys remember, okay, if you're, you're here on the, the very first um, 
part of this series, I went over Judges chapter one. In Judges chapter one, it gives us um, a rundown of all the tribes and the land that they were allotted and their attempt to take over that land. And all the tribes, they got into that land. They weren't able to completely take it over, but they were at least able to get into the land. Dan was the one tribe who the Amorites wouldn't even let them in. And so they couldn't get into their allotted land, so they went and settled somewhere else, but they were always looking for somewhere else to upgrade to, and that's why they sent some scouts to Ephraim. And so when these warriors arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, they came to Micah's house. Okay, so now we're, we're connecting these dots. They come to Micah's house, and they spent the night there. Verse 3 says this. It says, while at Micah's house, they recognized the young Levite's accent. So they went over and asked him, who brought you here, and what are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them about his agreement with Micah and that he had been hired as Micah's personal priest. Then they said, ask God whether or not our journey will be successful. Go in peace, the priest replied, for the Lord is watching over your journey. So the five men went to the town of Laish, where they noticed the people living carefree lives like the Sidonians. They were peaceful and secure. The people were also wealthy because their land was very fertile, and they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. So now these, these Danites, they're headed to go scout a land to find a new place to live. And they, they come down and they enter into Micah's neighborhood. They stop at, at Micah's house, and they see a Levite there. And they say, what are you doing here? Now, pay attention. When your unsaved friends, your unsaved neighbors, your unsaved coworkers are confused about why you are where they are, why you're doing what they're doing. Okay, pay attention. And while you're paying attention, also pay attention and be careful of people who only gas you up, but never jam you up, okay? Like, be, be careful of people who affirm your decisions but never challenge you. Because I'm going to tell you, the road to destruction is broad, it's wide, and it's full of people who are applauding you and patting you on your back as you're headed to a cliff. All right. They asked the Levite priest to ask God if their scouting expedition to a completely different area than the one he had already given them will be successful. And being assured by a pagan Levite serving in an idolatrous shrine. Okay, did I say all that right? Being assured that God is with them, that he's blessing the journey that they've already decided to go on, they go anyway. And they see that they can take by brutal force and in their own strength this land and don't have to rely on God. And so these scouts go back to their tribe. They tell them, hey, let's go get this land. It's great. It's perfect. The people are unsuspecting. It's a peaceful people. We can take this. Let's go. And so they do that. Starting in uh, verse 16, it says, as the 600 armed uh, warriors from the tribe of Dan stood at the entrance of the gate, the five scouts entered the shrine and removed the carved image, the sacred ephod, the household idols, and the cast idol. Meanwhile, the priest was standing at the gate with the 600 armed warriors. When the priest saw the men carrying all the sacred objects out of Micah's shrine, he said, what are you doing? Be quiet and come with us, they said. Put your hand over your mouth. Be a father and a priest to all of us. Isn't it better to be a priest for an entire tribe and clan of Israel than for the household of just one man? The young priest was quite happy to go with him. Whoa, 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 wait. I thought you were like a son to Micah. It was easy for him to abandon him. And so he took along the sacred ephod, the household idols, and the carved image. Now he joins in to help them take the stuff. They turned and they started on their way again, placing their children and livestock and possessions in front of them because they know that someone's going to come chase them down. And when the people from the tribe of Dan were quite a distance from Micah's house, the people who lived near Micah came chasing after them. They were shouting as they caught up with them. The men of Dan turned around and said to Micah, what's the matter? Why have you called these men together and chased after us like this? What do you mean, what's the matter, Micah said. You've taken away all the gods I've made and my priest, and I have nothing left. The men of Dan said, watch what you say. There are some short-tempered men around here who might get angry and kill you and your family. So the men of Dan continued on their way. When Micah saw that there were too many of them for him to attack, he turned around and went home. 
So Micah's idols were stolen from him. He chases the Danites down and he says this, it's very important. You took the idols I made in my priests and went away. What else do I have? Everything Micah looked to for blessing could be taken away from him and he had nothing else. And so it's important to note, looking at this, that if your God can be stripped from you, it is no God at all. If your God can be stripped from you, it's no God at all. How do I know that I'm serving a false God? Sean, thank you for asking, let me tell you. (laughs) When your God can be taken from you, it's a false God. You know you're serving a false God when your God can't defend itself. Okay, we see that in the story of Gideon, and we see it in 1 Kings with, uh, with Elijah. You know you're serving a false god when you constantly have to prop it back up. Right? You see that in 1 Samuel 5 with Dagon. All right? And so when we talk about gods in our lives that can be taken from us, we're talking about real things. There are things in all of our lives that have the potential to be elevated to God's status. And if you put those things in your life as a god, and it's taken away from you, it will devastate you. It will devastate you. Your job can be taken from you. Your money, your possessions can be taken from you. Your looks and your image can be taken from you. Proverbs says, beauty is fading. Okay. Your health can be taken from you. If you're used to being a person of strength and having the energy to do anything you want to do, your health can be taken. Your kids can be taken from you. I'm not saying that in a a morbid sense. I'm saying your children, many of us know this, are an assignment, right? An 18 to 21 year, if you're lucky, assignment, (laughs) all right? And so if you pour your whole life into your children and they grow up and they say, peace, like they should do, It'll devastate you. Your romantic relationship or your spouse can be taken from you. Listen, I love Amy to death, literally, okay? I, like, literally, love her so much. Um, you know, and our hope is, we talk about this all the time, you know, our hope is that the way that we die is like the movie Notebook, you know, <laughs> holding hands, holding hands, close our eyes, all right? But odds are, that she's going to be attending my funeral or I'm going to be attending hers. And if my God is in that coffin, if my whole world is in that coffin, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say something like what Micah said. You've taken the God that I made. and I have nothing left. If your God can be stripped from you, it's no God at all. And so the bummer of life without God is that we work way too hard to acquire the things that are way too easy to lose. Micah served gods that could be carried away, but as believers, you know what? We serve a God that carries us. Amen. We serve a God that carries us. At this time, we're gonna begin passing out the communion elements. We're gonna take communion together. So communion will be coming by. Uh, And let me just try to finish this story as we get to the end here. Verse 27, then when Mike, with Micah's idols and his priests, the men of Dan came to the town of Laish, whose people were peaceful and secure. They attacked with swords and burned to the, the town to the ground. There was no one to rescue the people, for they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. This happened in the valley near Beth Rehob. Then the people of the tribe of Dan rebuilt the town and lived there. They renamed the town Dan after their ancestor, Israel's son, but it had originally been called Laish. Then they set up the carved image and they appointed Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, as their priest. This family continued as priests for the tribe of Dan until the exile. Now, I told you the name of the Levite priest, Jonathan. I told you what his name means, but I want to tell you the meaning of Micah and Dan's names. All right, Micah's name means... Thank you, my guy. Micah's name means who is like Yahweh. And yet, in this story, we see him trying to create something like God. He makes an idol. Dan's name means judge. 
And yet, through the, though the Danites were meant to be a tribe of justice, they unjustly attacked a defensive land. And here's what I want you to see with defining their names, is that the further we get from God, the more we act out of alignment for who he created us to be. The further we get, the more we act out of alignment. Dan Block is an Old Testament scholar. He wrote a commentary in the book of Judges. He says this. He says, like Micah back in chapter 17, the Danites are characterized as opportunists and they are not driven by any divine mandate, but solely by their need for living space and their own notions of where and how their needs should be satisfied. And thus their conquest of Laish is described as a human achievement without any sense of reliance upon God. He goes on to say that indications of success do not confirm faithfulness to God. Ironically and tragically, the agendas people set for themselves are sometimes achieved, but the Danites show that success is not always a sign of righteousness, nor is it an indication that we must be doing something right. See, the story of the tribe of Dan proves that you can build a kingdom devoid of a real king and still look like you're doing pretty well. One thing that's interesting to note, final thought on Dan, and we'll begin the process of communion. One thing that's interesting to note is that in the book of First Chronicles, when all the tribes of Israel and the clans are listed, the tribe of Dan is not there. As you fast forward to the book of Revelation, and you look at chapter seven, when John is listing all the tribes of Israel that are present in the kingdom of God in New Jerusalem, the tribe of Dan is not there either. And so the sad ending for this tribe is that through idolatry, they forgot God and they were ultimately themselves forgotten. Let us stand together. So Micah, the Levite, and the Danites in this story, um, they are all doing what is right in their own eyes. And the very last verse of this narrative tells us what they should have done. Okay? This is what they should have done. Verse 31 of chapter 18 says, So Micah's carved image was worshipped by the tribe of Dan, as long as the tabernacle of God remained at Shiloh. See, God had made it possible for them to approach him, to worship him, to live with him and know him. The tabernacle, the place of God's presence among his people was in Shiloh, and that should have been the focal point of their lives. So should God's tabernacle today be for us. See, the man who is literally the word become flesh Jesus tabernacled among us. And if we do not center our lives on Jesus as the way to approach, as the way to worship, as a way to know and live with God, then we are centering our lives on man-made religion. We're centering our lives on what is right in our own eyes, idols, things that cannot bless. And so if you've had a blurred concept of God, or if you have found yourself dealing with spiritual compromise, or if you recognize today that you've been building a kingdom without the proper king, Jesus, the king of kings, is here today. And he has graciously provided everything that you need to give you clarity, to empower you to walk uprightly, and to build something in you that can never be taken away or destroyed by fire. But it's on you right now to initiate a peaceful transference of power. Amen. So I'm going to welcome up, welcome up my brother, Alex. He's going to help us with communion today. Alex is a man of God. He's my brother. I love you. Love you, man. Can you uh, lead us sure. with the uh, bread? Sure, sure. Uh, let's see. I have a challenge for everybody. Okay. So Sean said, hey, can you pray for communion? And then I wrote a message. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just not... Look, it's, it's real. Look at that, dude. Gosh. We got time. Yeah, no. It, it's church is long. Church is long. But 
Here's the uh, story I just wanted to share. So I had a really good friend of mine, amazing man of God, awesome character, all of that. As a family, um, he went through a betrayal with, uh, with uh, a group of family friends, and they were like family, all that stuff. And they were both believers. Well, he was at um, church one day, and this was like two months of just hell for him and all that stuff. So he was at church one day, and they started to do communion. And he looked at it, and he felt this overwhelming conviction in his heart that he could not participate in communion. He just could not do that. And the reason being is he knew in that moment, I'm not willing to forgive or let go of the hurt that's happened to me. Wow. Right? And so I want to challenge us. Um, if you have hidden sin, unforgiveness, or any other thing that's not aligned with God's character um, right now, and if you're not willing to let that up and to let that go, do not participate in communion right now. Mm-hmm. I want to release you to not come under a religious law and to help you out, 1 Corinthians 11, 27, 28 says, So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why some of you should examine yourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. So there's no shame. Right? My buddy realized I can't do this because I'm not willing to let go of the unforgiveness, but that was a moment between him and God to where, okay, let's work on this now. Jesus was still in partnership with him. So I just want to encourage us in that. Uh, So the bread, so the bread, okay. (laughs) Awesome. I'm just going to read scripture. So 1 Corinthians 11, 24. And gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. Oh, I'm moving forward. I got body. You got cup. Sorry. This is my body, which I've given to you. Father, thank you for giving us your body that heals us that made a way for us, that was given as a sacrifice for us to enter into your presence. So Holy Spirit, transform our bodies, heal our bodies, even now as we participate in eating of your body. We give you thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name. If your conscience allows you, go ahead and partake. Jesus, we thank you for your perfect, sinless blood. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you that you went to a cross and you bled out for us. You gave of yourself. You poured it all out. And Lord, we do this in remembrance of you as we just saw, Lord God, a tribe that was forgotten because they forgot you. God, today we remember you. We do this in remembrance of you. And so as we drink, Lord God, we drink with gratitude. Lord, we're thankful for all that you have done for us and all that you continue to do. And so as we partake, Lord, we commit ourselves to you afresh, Lord God, knowing that there's nothing that we can do without you. Let it be said of me, let it be said of us, that we weren't people who did right was in our own eyes, that we sought you. And so for some of us, that starts right now, and I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, let's all partake, family.